Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome, friends, to Heart to Heart with Anna. Today we have a special encore presentation of babysitting and daycare for CHD survivors. I hope you all enjoy it. Welcome to the 11th episode of the second season of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Our purpose is to empower members of our community with resources, support, and advocacy information. Today's show deals with babysitting and daycare for congenital heart defect survivors. I want to start off by stating that parents of children who have critical congenital heart defects, or CCHDs, face different challenges regarding babysitting and daycare than those parents of children who have surgeries that more completely repair their children's heart defects. Because children with CCHDs often have palliative care, which means that the children's hearts are fixed as well as they can be fixed at that given moment in time, and that there are not full repairs allowing the heart to function like a normal heart, our children are at more risk for future surgeries and complications than children with normal hearts. An excellent doctor, Dr. Doreen Rosenstruck, noted that we parents of children with CCHDs need to take certain things into consideration when looking for childcare for our children with CHDs. She mentioned that child care providers should be trained in pediatric advanced life support, or PALS, and they should also be able to recognize signs and symptoms of exacerbation of congenital heart defects in children. As many of you parents know, some of these signs include shortness of breath, change in color, usually it's a bluer tint around the mouth, and excessive sweating without exertion, fainting, which is also known as syncope, major changes in behavior such as unusual crankiness, etc. Dr. Rosenstrock mentioned that it was a good idea for child care providers to have continuous education for the entire staff, from the janitors to the head of the center, so that everyone knows when a child is in cardiac distress how to act on a child's behalf, since time is of the essence when it comes to caring for a child with a congenital heart defect. She also recommended that the school nurse and office should have oxygen tanks in the facility and that the teacher-to-child ratio should be lower. The learning environment should be one that reduces stress. It needs to be a relaxing environment, which might add to the overall cost of the center and to the cost of childcare. Thus, the government might need to help out such a center, which would be rather unique. Because of these considerations and many more, Many of us heart parents find that it is very difficult to find babysitting or daycare facilities that meet the requirements we so desperately need for our children to thrive. On top of that, we know that when children are exposed to many other young children, they are also exposed to many more germs, which can lead to more illness, which in turn could lead to more hospitalization. But not necessarily. It really depends on how much the CHD survivor's immune system has been compromised. Our topic today, babysitting and daycare for CHD survivors. To discuss this topic, our guests today are heart moms, Amy Bennett, Adina Marie Pellucci Alcina, and Don Silverman. Amy Bennett is mom to CHD warrior Bodhi, who was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS. Bodhi has had five open heart surgeries to date and is pacemaker dependent. In addition to being a heart mom, Amy is an attorney and a CPA and works part-time as an accounting consultant for nonprofit organizations. She also helped found and serves as treasurer for Sisters by Heart, the only national nonprofit organization providing support and care packages exclusively to newly diagnosed HLHS families. And as a Southern California Vice President of the California Chapter of the Children's Heart Foundation, Amy works both at home and at client locations, and has used a myriad of child care options, including both home-based babysitters and traditional daycare environments. Amy blogs regularly at www.hopeforbabybennett.com, and you can find out more about Sisters by Heart at www.sisters-by-heart.org. We'll meet Adina Marie Pellici Alcina and Don Silverman later in our show. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Amy. Thanks so much, Anna. I'm thrilled to be here. Let's talk about what you briefly alluded to in your bio, 
about how your job has required that you leave Bodhi with babysitters and in traditional daycare environments. First of all, tell me how old Bodhi was and how many surgeries he had before you left him with babysitters or in daycare. For the first time I left him in any sort of daycare setting outside of with my mother, with my husband. He was probably about 15 months old. He had had three open heart surgeries at that point. He had been much younger when they happened, so they were at five days old, two months old, and seven months old. And he had spent most of the first five months inpatient. I was the primary caretaker. Dad visited a lot in the hospital, but I was the primary one responsible for caretaking. So I was home with him full time after that final surgery. And Mm -hmm. then When he was about 15 months old, he'd been stable for about a year at that point. No further interventions. I want to say he'd maybe had one additional hospital stay for arrhythmia-related things. But really, he was home and stable with me. He was getting physical therapy in-home and occupational therapy in-home. But nothing more than 30 minutes here, an hour there. Maybe we had taken one date night, but certainly nothing regular. It was typical life with a new hypoplastic child or any significant CHD. And when he was about, uh, I don't know, 15, 14, 15 months, I was approached by a former employer asking me if I'd be interested in doing some contract work for her. And she indicated I could do it all at home. And I thought, oh, mm. what a great opportunity for me to get back in the workforce, but without leaving Bodie. Mm-hmm. So I started doing work for her five, ten hours a week at home. We have a daughter who's four years older than Bodie. So we brought in a sitter who we knew to watch him in our home at that point in time. So you have a daughter who is four years older, and she was probably in school by this time, in kindergarten? Yeah, so she oh, was she's in three preschool. Years older than him. Okay. So she, mm-hmm. And we left her in preschool when he was born during most of his long stay at one point. We pulled her out, and then we put her back in four months later in the fall. So she was in a preschool environment. And her preschool had a nursery where she had started two months old, three months old, but we opted to not put Bodhi in a daycare setting environment at that point. The sitter who was coming to our house, it was just one of those things where, as we found, and I think a lot of parents find this, things just work out the way they're supposed to, and they really did Mm -hmm. with us. It was a sitter who had been a teacher of the school that our daughter had gone to. So we had a very close relationship with her. She has her specialty in early childhood development. And at the time, she was between jobs. I think she was pursuing her master's, and so she was looking for a little extra nanny and work on the side. So we snatched her up for a couple days a week. Wow. It was was great. She knew CPR, which was my big concern. Mm -hmm. And she knew how to relate to young kids, which was my other big concern. So she probably knew your family history very well as well. She did. And I will tell you, I I don't think um, Bodhi is the only child like this who's been through what he's been through. He had major separation anxiety to the point where it was hard for me to leave the room without him breaking down and crying, let alone work in another room in the house. So when she first started, there were days where I would sneak out the front door, pretend like I was leaving, so he'd be happily mm-hmm. playing with her, and I'd sneak in the back door and work in our bedroom, which is in the back of the house, which was fine until he figured uh, out I was there and wanted to be with me. You were desensitizing him. I think what you did was brilliant. You know, it really worked out. It was a challenge, but it really worked great, and we laugh now, and we tell her she laid all the groundwork for how much fun he has with the sitters in at school now, but she had to deal with a lot of <laughs> trickery and trying to uh, <laughs> convince him that he was having fun and distraction. But, so she was a perfect one for the job because she was used to, you know, babies being dropped off at daycare who didn't necessarily want to be there and needed a little bit of adjustment. So she was perfect. So we did that for, I think, about six months or so, a, close to a year. Um, and over the course of that time, his physical therapist noticed that he could use a little more help with the separation anxiety. And she recommended, because she worked at a center, She recommended that we bring him to the center for physical therapy. And the center happened to have two different stages of developmental preschool. The first one was very hands-on, like six kids and three teachers, and the parents usually stayed. It was a lot of sensory work. And then once the children graduated from that program, they could go into the actual developmental preschool, which was 15 kids, run entirely by 10 physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists, and it was two and a half hours, three days a week, a true mini preschool. It was a very gradual transition for us. We started in home, and then while he was still in home, we started sending him a couple of mornings a week to the first step of the developmental preschool. Once his separation anxiety had started to abate a little bit, he was ready for bigger things. Then we stepped him up into the 
true developmental preschool, and that was an incredible program for him. And so then, was he already in the regional program with the public schools? Is that what helped to fund that? He he wasn't, so, and I think it's different across the country, but here in Southern mm-hmm. California, and they start with regional center, which is birth to three, and regional mm-hmm. center funds early intervention services. Then when they turn okay. three, they're assessed for a possible IEP by the school district. And then mm-hmm. they move into the school district-based programs, and the school district pays at that point. For the first three years, it's all paid by county regional services. For us, one of our big challenges with Bodhi is not just when I left, but transitioning from one activity to another was hard for him because I was his comfort mm-hmm. item, and I wasn't there for him when he sure. was transitioning. So he was in that developmental preschool for about a year until he turned three. They worked consistently, and we had goals that we worked on consistently to get him to the point where he could transition without crying every time. It was great to have a a preschool that's run by occupational therapists and physical therapists. It's just a phenomenal opportunity for kids who've been through what these kids have been through because they really can identify their problems and things we need to work on. So it was Mm -hmm. an incredible opportunity for us. So then at that point, we just transitioned him to a traditional preschool. He was ready. And now Mm -hmm. I work three days a week for two different clients, and he goes all day, three days a week. And, you know, like everything else, it was a little transition, but he really did well, and he's in pre-kindergarten now and loves it. And I have a unique experience because I only work part-time, and my schedule is really flexible, and I can work from home or at client sites. So my child care needs are vastly different from your full-time stay-at-home mom or your full-time working mom. But we were really lucky that we had a lot of opportunities and things we could mold to my schedule, which is really nice. Uh, But I wouldn't say you're really lucky, Amy. I would say, no, sweetheart, you are really intelligent about the way that you approach this. And you made sacrifices. Had you gone back to work full-time, and with your background you certainly could have, things would have been very different. You made sacrifices and choices to benefit Bodhi and your family overall. Well, thank you. I didn't really think about it that way. You, when you're in the moment, you just do what you got to do, what works best for the yes. circumstances. And I will say, <laughs> the way we did it, we were lucky enough that our schedules were able to accommodate it, that my husband was able to work and I could stay home. Mm-hmm. And we were lucky that everything just fell into place. And I think that's part of the reason Bodhi's doing as well as he is, is because our schedules afforded mm-hmm. us the opportunity to transition him through all the stages where he needed a little bit of extra transition. If you do have the opportunity to slowly transition them at their own pace from a sitter occasionally to a sitter a little more common, I know a lot of stay-at-home moms will do that through regular date nights or mommy and me activities. I think a lot of these kids deal with the same type of separation anxiety issues Bodhi suffered from. I think it's important if you have the flexibility to be able to transition them along one step at a time at their speed because every kid is going to need more or less adjustments. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. We really do have to follow our children's lead, and I think we really do need to see where they are psychologically. It's not just the parents who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. I honestly believe that a lot of our children, especially as they get older and they become more cognizant of being in the hospital and being separated from mommy and daddy and sisters or brothers if there are also siblings in the family, I think they also suffer from a certain amount of PTSD or just anxiety. It's not normal to have all these machines attached to you and beeping constantly and strangers coming and checking on you all hours of the day and night. None of that's really normal. And once you've been home for a while and then you get thrust in that environment, it doesn't seem normal. When that's all you've known, then it does seem normal. But once you've been home for a while and you've been acclimated to what is normal, then going into that hospital environment can be stress-inducing. So I think you're right. We need to take the cues from our children and act on those progressively. We can't expect our children just to automatically make changes because it would make our lives easier. (laughs) I think we all know that as our parents, our lives are not ever going to be easy ever again. (laughs) I totally agree. And I think to the extent that a parent who's facing the dilemma of daycare not for their child or in-home care for their child has an opportunity to find someone to watch their child who maybe is used to dealing with medically fragile children who've spent a great amount of time in the hospital, I think it's better because they can have a little more patience, a little more understanding that there may be little PTSD triggers, there may be more separation Mm -hmm. anxiety. There are issues that these kids deal with that a child who has not been through what they've been through deals with. Absolutely. And here's the thing. It sounds like your angels were watching over you and you had those people brought into your life at just the right time. Sometimes those kinds of things happen because we're looking for them and because we know what to look for. 
And sometimes you really have to work hard for it to happen. It doesn't just happen to you. So we need to encourage parents to know what to look for, know how to find these people. It's not always easy. It certainly is easier if you live in an area that has a highly educated population. And I think it's much more difficult if you live in a place like Alaska or places where there aren't hospitals that treat children with congenital heart defects, especially critical congenital heart defects like HLHS. And so we need to let parents know those people are out there and here are some of the ways that you can find them. You had your angels watching over you and Bodhi too. It sounds like he... (laughs) really had some extra help. (laughs) (laughs) He did. He needed it, and we were very lucky to have found it. Yes. Well, Amy, what was the hardest part of having to leave Bodhi in daycare? It sounds like part of it was that transitioning period and dealing with the separation anxiety. What else was really difficult for you to endure? I think the hardest part for me was letting go a little bit. Like a lot of a lot of parents who've been through this have a little bit of OCD about making sure things are done exactly right. And I had been the one in the hospital by his side for so long. I had been the one at home with him administering medications, prepping bottles, watching him like a hawk to get to a point where I was okay with someone else doing that, someone else not being as finely attuned to his needs as I was. That was a big step for me to know he was going to be completely out of my sight to start with two and a half and four hours and a little bit longer each time. And especially not so much at home because I could pop out and peek at him if I needed to, but at a off-site at a center somewhere, that was a big step for me to not be hovering over him and being within arm's reach to check on him and make sure he's okay. Like anything else, it was a transition, but it was a hard transition for me personally. Mm -hmm. I can totally relate to that. Since my son was also born with HLHS, I found it very hard to leave him with anyone. I just had this sense of dread that something would happen to him unless I was right there with him. And that somehow, if I was there right over him, (laughs) that nothing bad would happen. And I know that doesn't make any sense, but like you, I was with him in the hospital constantly. I knew what to look for. And I think it's very frightening for us moms who are there with our children constantly while they're in the hospital to believe that somebody else is going to be as finely attuned to our children as we are. You hit the nail on the head. (laughs) I felt those Mm -hmm. exact same things. Good to know I'm not alone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we're we're not alone. (laughs) We're not alone, Amy. There's a whole community out there who really feels like we do, but you know what? Most people don't talk about it. It's almost like it's taboo for us to say we have these feelings because we have to be the strong mom. We have to be the mama bears or mama tigers who are out looking for our children. And I don't think people realize the internal conflict that we're going through. You're absolutely right. It's a challenge, something that we don't really talk about. Amy, what best advice do you have for parents who might need to leave their children who have congenital heart defects with a babysitter or a daycare because they do have to return to work? I think my best advice would be to seek out opportunities to find the right person to watch your child. Understand that when you have a CHD child, it's going to be a little different experience searching for a babysitter or a daycare center. That the center that any other children you had went to or that your neighbor sends your daughter or son to might be the right place, but it might not be. And I think you need to talk to your CHD or pediatrician, talk to the cardiologist. If they're getting any sort of physical therapy or occupational therapy services already, Those are oftentimes great resources of people who may say, oh, you want to send them to a daycare setting. You know, I happen to know of a daycare setting where they have more than one physical therapist or occupational therapist on site. Or, oh, I happen to know of one who specializes in medically fragile children or children with special needs. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I happen to know of someone who has experience with this. Because every single one of those are going to make the transition a little bit easier and are going to be able to give your child maybe extra things that haven't even occurred to you that they might need along the way. That is such excellent advice, Amy. And you know what? You hit on something that we haven't really talked about, but that is learning the jargon, medically fragile, children with congenital heart defects. These are terms that we use now in our normal vernacular, which we probably didn't use before we had children with HLHS brought into our families. But those are the terms that you use when looking for a facility or looking for a daycare provider. And you're so right. It's all about networking, don't you think? Absolutely. And it's about understanding what opportunities are out there. I think the thing that 
is frustrating to me is when I see parents who didn't know there was an opportunity to take advantage of. And a lot of times, especially with kids who've been through what, what our kids have been through, it's all about getting intervention and services as early as possible. And mm-hmm. so if you can combine that with any daycare choices you have, that's even better. It's just helping them get a mm-hmm. little bit further ahead than they would have been otherwise. And it's just mm-hmm. all about knowing what opportunities are out there and taking advantage of them. Oh, you are so right. The sooner you get children who are medically fragile or who have special needs, as soon as you can get them into a program, that's the sooner you can start to remediate any problems they might have, plus pay attention and be on the lookout for potential problems so that you don't make those stumbling blocks in the development so they can be equal to their peers when they're ready to start school. So you're so right. The sooner we can get them in a place where we can remediate any problems they may have had from those long hospitalizations and being on a ventilator and having paralyzing drugs in their body. All those things are not normal for our child's development. So we have to overcome that one way or another. And you're so right, that early intervention, it's not just about watching the child so that the child eats and has clean diapers and is intellectually stimulated. It's also about remediating some of the problems that they may have. Absolutely, and I think a lot of parents, when they're looking for the immediate need of a babysitter or a daycare, they might not even realize there are opportunities out there where early intervention doesn't necessarily have to be a completely separate setting from a daycare or from a babysitter. Sometimes, in some places, you may have an opportunity to combine the two, which also means less therapy appointments, less intervention services in general, and a little bit of a smoother transition for your child. Because they can actually use play and things that the children are normally doing, such as eating, the occupational or physical therapist can be there while they're eating and help introduce foods to them so they help get rid of any oral aversions they have, and so feeding issues become less of a problem. And There are so many different ways that in a normal way, these people can be doing therapy. Our kids don't even know about it, and we don't have to take them to another center. So I think what you said, your advice was brilliant and spot on. And these may be things that our children's pediatric cardiologists don't even think to tell the parents. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I wish every pediatric cardiologist or pediatrician knew about, in particular, these developmental preschool opportunities because I think they are just so phenomenal for our kids. And I wish that more doctors right, exactly. and more parents knew about them. Well, and it's about treating the whole child, which as parents, that's what we are charged with doing. The pediatric cardiologists are charged with taking care of their heart. And that's, of course, of critical importance. But as parents, we have to take care of the whole child. And that means these developmental issues as well. Amy, you have been so awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing all of that awesome advice with us. And I hope there are some pediatric cardiologists who listen to our show because it really wouldn't be that hard to continue the education of the parents with these kinds of things in mind. It really wouldn't take them that much longer, but I think that's what Sisters by Heart, the organization that you work with, and your lovely blog. I just love your blog. You're so down to earth and you share things that other people may not be aware of on a daily basis. I think that has been so helpful. We're so lucky we have the Internet and we have ways to interact with each other and learn things from each other that our doctors may not think to tell us about. I do need to take a quick commercial break, but don't leave because you'll be coming back later at the end of the show in our in-studio session where we have everybody together. Coming up next, we'll have another heart mom who has a child with a complex congenital heart defect. We'll discover how she felt about having to return to the workforce and how she found the right care for her daughter when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, A handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with heart moms Amy Bennett, Adina Marie Pellici Asina, and Dawn Silverman. We just finished talking with Amy about her experience of finding proper care for her son with a critical congenital heart defect when she had to return to work. And now we'll turn our attention to Adina Marie Pellici Asina. 
Adina Marie Pellici Asina has two daughters, Briella, who is eight months of age, and Ariana, who is nine years old. She has a bachelor's in criminal justice and is a part-time photographer. Adina's pregnancy was rough, and she was diagnosed with preeclampsia, which forced her to have to stop working. Briella was immediately airlifted at birth to Miami Children's Hospital. She spent 77 days in the critical intensive care unit. Adina and her husband both struggled with taking off work, especially since her husband is a detective. While Adina stayed by Briella's side during this long hospital stay, her husband had to continue work in order to maintain the bills and keep a sense of order to their lives. Briella has had one open-heart surgery by Dr. Burke and a catheterization or cast procedure by Dr. Rhodes. Briella has tetralogy of fallot, double outlet right ventricle, pulmonary stenosis, an atrial septal defect or ASD, a ventricular septal defect or VSD, and partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, which is also known as PAPVR. She has another open heart surgery and several caths in her future. Getting back to work and establishing childcare has been challenging since the diagnosis of Briella's heart defects. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna Adina. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm so happy to talk to you, and I'm excited for you to be on the show. Yes, I'm excited, too. Adina, spending over two months in the hospital, 77 days, oh, that must have felt like forever. I know you had to put your life on hold while Briella was in the hospital. How soon after Briella was able to come home did you return to work, and what arrangements did you have to make for Briella at that time? Prior to being pregnant, I was a paralegal for four years at a law firm, and unfortunately, my pregnancy was very difficult. Many times we weren't even sure if the pregnancy was even going to last. I was on strict bed rest several times throughout the pregnancy. I had a few hospitalizations as well. I developed preeclampsia, which led to my water breaking, and Briella even came early. So not only was she a heart baby, she was also premature. So that led to more time in the hospital, like you said, for 77 days. And since because Briella was a fragile state at that time, I wasn't even able to go back to a career. I had to stay with her basically that entire time because I was also breastfeeding. So that Mm -hmm. led to me staying by her side the entire 77 days. I lived an hour away, so I would drive in the morning at 6 a.m. down there, and I would stay all the way up till midnight and drive back home. Oh, my goodness. That must have been so stressful for you. Yes, it was very frustrating, but she's been worth it. I had to put a lot on hold with my career, but making sure she was stable and have a good life was very important to me, especially with being in the situation we were in. Sure. Now, you said you were breastfeeding her. Were you actually able to take her to your breast, or were you having to pump and then they fed her through a feeding tube or they fed her with a bottle? No, I put her to the breast. I was very big on breastfeeding, and it was very important to me as I did it with my nine-year-old as well when she was a baby up till about a year and a half. So that was the first thing I was very concerned about. That was one reason why I wanted to take off so much time with my career so I was able to breastfeed and make sure that she got proper nutrition while she was in the hospital. I just did an episode recently on breastfeeding, and we talked about how important that is. So it's nice to hear another mom who was able to successfully breastfeed her complicated child with a critical congenital heart defect. So how premature was Briella? Briella was born at 35 weeks, but okay. she was not super tiny. She was 5 oh. pounds, 9 ounces, and went, it went down to 5 pounds. So she was mm-hmm. a decent size for being premature. Yes, that's actually a very good size for a premature baby. And five weeks while early isn't too critical. It sounds like she was able to overcome the fact that she came that early. And and she had the strength to breastfeed, which is just awesome. Yes, she did very well. Um, We had minor bumps, um, nothing severe during the long 77 days. She was on oxygen off and on. Other than that, it was a waiting game. I basically wasn't able to work. My husband had to return to work because the department would not give him 77 days off. Unfortunately, crime right. continues, and he can't say, sorry, your house just mm-hmm. had a burglary. I have a baby over here. So one of us had to pick up the slack, and he returned, and I stayed with her. And then my mother-in-law helped with our 9-year-old. Luckily, we mm-hmm. had her in December, so there was no school. Mm. 
Luckily, and yet that must have been unbelievably difficult to leave your nine-year-old day after day, not knowing how many days you would be in the hospital with Briella, not knowing if you would eventually bring a baby home. Right. It was very stressful for her, too, as well, not knowing what was going on with her sister, because, like you said, she's nine, and it's a very unexplored situation for her as well. She's as new to this situation as we are, so it's hard to tell her what's going to occur. It sounds like having Grandma there was a bit of a comfort for her, and she didn't have to go to school and be worried. She was right there with Grandma and could probably pick up the phone and call you if she was nervous or anxious about anything. Yes, it was great to have my mother-in-law help with us. And whenever my daughter was feeling a little insecure about the situation or uncomfortable, she would just pick up the phone. And we did a lot of FaceTime so she could see her sister and such. And when my husband was not working, he would bring her over so she could visit. Oh, I didn't get how long it was before you actually did return to work. Since um, I had Briella, I did not go back to working back at the law firm. I've been doing part-time photography. I've worked with major companies like LaCroix Water and other large firms doing advertising. Here and there, I'll do a couple gigs on the side. When I do leave Briella, I leave her with my mother-in-law. Your last caller brought up a great point about wanting to have somebody qualified in CPR, so that's probably something I'm going to have my mother-in-law do now because I think that's very important. But other than that, I haven't found really a babysitter yet, because she's only now just turned eight months yesterday. But your mother-in-law obviously loves her and is probably very attuned to what is normal for Briella and when she should be concerned. Yeah, she is, and most of the time my daughter is also home. I've Mm -hmm. kind of helped my daughter understand the things that are important with her sister. She knew at the time when Briella was on all her medications, every dose of medication to what she needs, signs to look for, for like blueness or breathing heavy, anything that she needs to know to also assist my mother-in-law just in case something was to be forgotten. They kind of worked out as a great team whenever I need to step out of the house for something I need to do with work. Absolutely. It sounds like you're using a team approach, which is really awesome. And it's really empowering to both your daughter and to your mother-in-law that you trust them and that you trust Briella. I think that's one of the things that's so hard for us heart moms is to let go of that fear that something might happen if we're not right there and to trust that somebody else who loves our children will be there and will do the right thing. Now, before I was allowed to take Alex home, I had to do CPR. And since Alex was going to be staying with my mom part of the time, they made my mom do the CPR class as well. It doesn't sound like that was a requirement for you and for your mother-in-law? It was a requirement for myself when I left. I had to watch a long video and learn CPR as well. And then they actually make me take a test. Since my Mm -hmm. husband is in law enforcement, he already knows that and is certified. So all he had to do is show his little card and he gets recertified regularly with the police department Mm because that is definitely a requirement. Both of us were fine. However, at the time, we weren't thinking, okay, now what are we going to do when we get out of the hospital? Who's going to watch our child when we need to go into work? So now we're just getting adjusted since she's still at such a young age. So now that's something that I think is very important and something I want my mother-in-law to do. So in case something were to happen, she would know how to handle the situation. And I'm probably going to even consider having my nine-year-old learn CPR as well. I don't think that there's an age where life-saving skills should not be learned. I agree with you 100%. My boys, when they were in Boy Scout, learned that. And I agree. Nine years old is certainly old enough, especially given her situation, where she has this sister who is medically fragile. I think they're smart enough to be able to do it. And you know what? Sometimes kids react better than adults do (laughs) because they don't have the same fears that some of us adults have. So I think that's brilliant. I I really think that would be something that I would want to do as well. What advice would you give to parents who have to return to the workforce and who have to leave their child with a babysitter or a mother-in-law or somebody other than themselves so they can return to work? I would make sure that everyone that you're planning on leaving your child with is qualified in things like CPR and understand the things that come with congenital heart defects, the risks 
the precautions that are needed, the medications. Like I said, my nine-year-old knew all the medications that need to be distributed at the time when Briella was on them. It's important for caregivers to understand that there are some things that you need to watch out for and that the situation can be very risky. So it's not something that, oh, here's a baby, watch the baby and everything's fine. You have to kind of watch for certain things. Briella was on a monitor for a little while, and I know that it was important to make sure she wasn't desatting and watch her heart rate and such after she came home. Right. I think teaching them how to use those monitors and knowing what the numbers mean so that they don't freak out if it's something that's normal for our kids, but wouldn't be normal for somebody who doesn't have a heart to fed. I think that's very good that they have to have training. Thank you so much, Adina, for coming on the show and for sharing with us. Now it's time for a commercial break, but don't leave because we will be having our time in the studio together later on with all of the moms. Coming up next, we have a heart mom who's a mental health counselor, and we'll find out about what special child care situation she created for her CHD survivor when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Today we are talking with Heart Moms Amy Bennett, Adina Marie Police Alcina, and Dawn Silverman. We just finished talking with Amy and Adina Marie about their experiences of having to return to the workforce, and how to find child care for their CHD survivors. And now we will turn our attention to Dawn Silverman. Dawn Silverman is a licensed mental health counselor, a freelance writer, and a full-time mom to three children, Cameron, aged 14, Leah, aged 11, and Caden, who is five years old. Caden was prenatally diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS, He has undergone three palliative open-heart surgeries at Miami Children's Hospital and will be starting kindergarten in the fall of 2014. Caden is lucky to have had all of his grandparents living nearby, so he has had trusted babysitters who understood his congenital heart defect and any potential warning signs. Caden spent two and a half years going to preschool. Don chose a facility where the director was also a licensed nurse. Though his teachers started off the year nervous, they became much more comfortable with Caden as they became more educated about HLHS and saw how strong Caden was. Congenital heart defect advocacy has become very important to Dawn. She is pursuing her PhD in psychology and is currently writing her dissertation on the pregnancy experiences of mothers whose babies have been diagnosed with single ventricle defects. Thank you for coming on Heart to Heart with Anna, Dawn. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. I am too. Boy, we're talking a lot about HLHS today. It seems like so many of my contacts are moms who have children with HLHS. And Caden is five, which is just awesome to hear that he's doing so well at this age already. Yes, yes. So don't get me to cry. So so yes, he's doing wonderful. (laughs) And we've been very blessed with his treatment and his presentation of HLHS. He's had a fairly uncomplicated history. It really is nice when they make it to age five. It's almost like that's a miracle milestone because once they make it to that age, they seem to do much better and they don't have impending surgeries on them like they do in those first five years. Exactly. Dawn, it sounds like you were very lucky to have family members who were able to care for Caden after you returned to work. Did your family members have to go through any special training? Our family had to go through the CPR training when Caden was released from the hospital. My mother was a preschool teacher, so she had CPR training way back in the day. So nobody actually had any particular training in that realm, but I made it a point that at the very beginning, my mother came along with me to all of Caden's cardiology appointments so that she would learn the lingo, she would learn the signs, she would understand what things meant. So if he was left in her care and there was an emergency, she would know what she would need to tell paramedics, what to look for, who the doctors were. And so it was important to me that she had a relationship with them so that if I couldn't be there, they would know who she was and be able to communicate with her. Right. She could speak with authority 
on what Casey right. had been through and what his diagnosis was and what medications he was on. That was brilliant. And I do think it's so important for other people who might be taking care of our children to know what their diagnosis is, to know what kind of medications they're on, to know, hmm, this little bit of blue, that's normal. <laughs> right. But wait a minute. Right. If it gets much worse than that, that's a sign. That's a sign that may need some help. And I think that that education and also empowering them to be knowledgeable and to know what to ask is so important. Yes, I think that was important to her as well because it made her feel more comfortable and capable taking care of him once she became educated about what to look for. And I think it eased her anxiety so that when she did babysit him, it was a more enjoyable experience because she could focus on him and not be so anxious about, oh, is he breathing too fast? Is he getting enough hydration? She wasn't having to focus as much on those things because she kind of knew what if they were to come up, that's when she'd have to address it. So it made it better relationship for them as well so she can focus on just having fun with him when she would watch him. So that was another positive thing that came out of her becoming educated is that it allowed her to have the more quality time with him. Well, in a more normal grandma-baby right. relationship. Right. You know, I think, Dawn, that that's something that really is not talked about much, and that is how having a child with a congenital heart defect has this trickle-down effect and affects the aunts, the grandparents, cousins, the siblings, of course. It really does affect everyone in the heart community, in your heart community. And the more we educate each other, the more we share that information, the more we're empowering our other caretakers, the other loved ones in our environment. Sometimes it's friends. It's not even people that are blood-related to us. But when we educate and we all learn together and we share that information, it really does empower us to all have a more normal relationship with each other. Don't you think that's true? I do. And just as important to our family was to give Caden as normal, quote unquote, uh, upbringing as possible. And as much as we can, we don't let his HLHS become a defining factor of who he is. I look at it that, yes, he is a heart child, but he is a boy who happens to have a heart condition. And we try to keep that in the background unless it needs to be brought to the foreground. So it was very important to us to raise him that way, to not give him that quote-unquote special treatment unless he needed it because he came into a family already with two older siblings who treated him just like they would have treated a heart-healthy baby. They didn't know any different. He didn't know any different. And although they were stressed with having us away when he was in the hospital and things of that nature, you know, we really tried to not make that the focus of who he is. And I think education becomes very important with that. When you're educating your family members, you're educating teachers, you're educating your friends, once they understand what this CHD means, it puts everybody at ease because it's not like that big gray elephant in the room once you address it, if you explain what it means and what to look for and that you don't have to tiptoe around him and you don't have to worry if he falls. It gives everybody that sense of comfort that once they understand it and they know what to look for, they know they don't need to be freaking out about this, but perhaps they should be freaking out about that if that happens. Don, I absolutely love that. That is so perfect for every heart parent to know, especially if you're pregnant with a baby that you know is going to be born with heart defects. We can lead a fairly normal life. I know it's not normal compared to people who don't have children with heart defects, but you're so right. This doesn't have to be the elephant that everyone tiptoes around. You are so right. Education is what empowers everybody. What I have seen, too, is that those who accept that education and those who listen to what we're telling them I'm sorry if Alex falls down or if Caden falls down or if Briella falls down, they're going to bruise more because they're on baby aspirin. Don't freak out over that. They will bruise more or they will bleed more because they're on anticoagulants. And this is totally normal. You don't have to freak out. However, if they faint, that's when we need to do something. Right. So you give them the signs and the signals to let them know when they should freak out over something and when they shouldn't. And what I discovered was there were some people who couldn't handle that. And and those were people that Mm -hmm. we just didn't spend much time with. And the people who did feel empowered by that and who did learn to accept that and move on with it, they got to be part of our lives, and we were able to assume a more normal relationship. 
Yes, that's so funny you said that about the aspirin because that is the one line I have told every teacher thus far that if you see him come in with a thousand bruises on his legs, please don't assume he's getting abused at home. This is all the aspirin (laughs) (laughs) that that he bruises very easily because you get concerned when you see a child and they have 15 black and blue marks on their leg. You think, hmm, what's going on there? So again, it comes down to education. And I think with anything, the more people understand something, the more empowered they feel and the more comfortable they are with whatever challenge they're presented with. Well, I love how you and Amy both had really special circumstances for when you first left your children in a situation where they were not with you. And you actually found a preschool that had a licensed nurse. Was that something you sought out, or was that something where your angels were watching over you? Like I think Amy's it's, angels it's were watching funny over because, her. Yes, when you were talking about that with the angels, because I have two two stories with this, and that, that yes, we looked around because I did want to put him in a preschool that was closer to our home. And the preschool that he ultimately ended up going to was the one that my other children went to. And that was because the director was a licensed nurse. I felt I needed more than the teachers just being CPR trained because mm-hmm. so much with this condition is if you can catch some of the warning signs ahead of time, you can prevent Mm -hmm. something from getting worse. And I felt that Mm -hmm. teachers that were just CPR trained, that's great. God forbid there was an emergency, they can do CPR. Mm -hmm. But if there was an actual nurse on staff, she might be able to look at him and be like, you know what, I don't like the way he's breathing. He's looking a little Mm -hmm. bit blue to me. Let's intervene before it gets worse. So it turned out that I was aware of this preschool because it was where my other kids went. It's just it was further away from me and not as close as the other one I was considering. And a friend of mine had told me, well, you know what? At the end of the day, it's closer to the hospital. So you would rather the paramedics get there before you get there. They're the ones that are going to help. That was my debate was just the distance. But I did feel that having the nurse there was more of a benefit. And we just found out now that the nurse at his kindergarten, where he will be going to school next year, used to be a CICU nurse at the hospital where he had all of his surgeries. So oh, wow. I think there the angels are working with these kids. It never <laughs> surprises me when you hear stories like that. It seems to fall into place sometimes with these kids that the right people are there for them at the right time. So, yeah, I think that there was some divine intervention there to some level. <laughs> but that was important because I think with the preschools that they knew me as a parent and mm-hmm. they knew that I would not have been bringing Caden there for school and their care if I didn't feel he was well enough to be in that Mm -hmm. setting or if it was not the appropriate setting for him to be in. So there was already that kind of built-in trust between me and the director of the preschool, which helped make them feel more secure as well because they would know that I wouldn't be putting him there if I felt that he was too much for them to handle in a sense. Right. So once again, just like with Amy, there's that family history. There's a certain amount of comfort that you feel when they already know your family. Right. And they know you as a parent and respect that and know Mm -hmm. that if I'm telling you, yes, he's going to be fine, you're more likely to worry about this than that, that they would take that at my word and believe that and know that I'm not just trying to say that just to get him into the program. Right. And I think also what you just said about respect, that is so important. You already had that relationship established, so you weren't trying to build respect with them as you were leaving your son. You already had that relationship established, which makes things that are complicated, such as leaving a child who is medically fragile, a little bit less complicated because at least they know you, they respect you, and they know how to get a hold of you if something does go wrong. Right. And his teachers, for each of the years that he's been there, they were all nervous at the beginning. I try to explain to them that on paper, it sounds a lot worse than how he presents in person. But of course, they were nervous and I would get the reports every day when I kept asking him if he wanted a drink. I kept asking him this. You know, he was breathing a little bit fast, but they were so nervous and I felt like I had to sit there and it's okay, it's okay. And Kaden would come home from school and tell me, well, my teacher cheats telling me to drink and I tell her I'm not thirsty. <laughs> so I mean, so he, he can advocate to some degree on himself, but it was funny. So that, that was comforting to me because at least then I knew the teacher's were paying attention to those things because he was complaining about that. They get so nervous. But then as the year would progress and they would see him out there running with the other kids and him being fine and him, he keeps up with his peers without any problems. So 
they felt he assimilated into the class and became a more normalizing experience for them and for him. And by the end of the year, again, it was the same idea that they were aware. There was notices up in the classroom, you know, with his picture and his information in case there was a problem. And there was another Mm -hmm. teacher in the room who didn't know him. There was a place that this is his picture, this is his condition, this is who you need to call. But other than that, Mm -hmm. it, again, went into the background. And they just let him Mm -hmm. be a regular kid in a regular preschool class. And that's what I want as a parent. I respect that Mm -hmm. there are certain moms with children who have these conditions that their children can't have that because maybe they're more or immune compromised, there's other issues going on. But we were in a situation personally for us that that was not Caden's history. So it was important to be as regular and normal as he could be unless it needed to be the focus of attention. We didn't want the CHD being who he was. And, right, right, right. That right. wasn't the focal point. Well, it sounds to me like you and Caden empowered those teachers. And this is what happens with all of us in the heart community anyway. We were all learning and growing together. And the more they Mm -hmm. got to know Caden, and he was able to be a vocal advocate for himself, the more comfortable everyone became. Yes, definitely. And that's why, again, I saw firsthand how important it is to teach and educate and advocate for CHDs so people are aware of these. And Caden does like to share parts that he understands. So, And his mm-hmm. teachers were always so wonderful about that and really encouraged him when it was show and tell time. And with the letter was an eight, he talked about his heart and brought him pictures of the helicopters and life flights and oh. hospitals. And whenever he had the opportunity to do something like that, his teachers were always so wonderful to reinforce that and help the other kids in the class ask the right questions so that they would start to understand, even at such a young age, an appreciation for the fact that Caden has had to go to the hospital and had surgeries, and he does have a special heart. So even his little classmates were learning this information, too. So it was empowering on so many different levels. So many different people were learning from what he had to share. It was neat to see how someone so little can still start to advocate and empower even young kids at his age. I love that story, Dawn. That's just awesome. That's exactly what parents of babies or women who are pregnant who are told that they're going to have a baby with a heart defect, that is exactly what they need to hear, that their children can Mm -hmm. be strong, that they can speak up for themselves, that they can let other people know what's going wrong. And I think that's just so critical that we teach them from the earliest age possible that they can be advocates for themselves and that they can speak up for themselves and people will respect what they Mm -hmm. say. I think that's just so critically important. I agree. I believe it, and I've said this a lot, that we can't, I think, as heart parents, expect the world to cater to us and our children, that our children need to grow up in this world and they need to learn how to work within the world and advocate for themselves and can't expect everybody to come to them that the responsibility will ultimately rest on them to function in the world that we're in. So to teach the children those skills early, that's, again, another important thing, one of the things that my husband and I do value when it comes to all our children, but especially with Caden. Right. Right, right, really for all of our kids. So I like that because Mm -hmm. there are children who have diabetes, there are children who have epilepsy, there are children who have other health conditions where they too need to know what is normal for them, what medications they Mm -hmm. take, what their condition is, and how to be an advocate for themselves. We're seeing this more and more and more with autism coming to the forefront, ADHD. There are so many Mm -hmm. different conditions Mm -hmm. where children do have to have medication and they do have to have special considerations that it really is is our job as parents to empower our children and teach them how to be advocates for themselves. Well, Don, I have a question for you because your son is much younger than my son. My son will be 20 this month in August mm-hmm. 2014. And wow. way back when, almost 20 years ago, the doctors discouraged me from putting Alex in daycare because they said he would be exposed to too many germs and that that would force him to be put into the hospital more often. It doesn't sound like that was a concern of yours. Did you have any problems with him contracting more illnesses since he was around so many little children? No, again, I think there's angels involved, but we were careful between his first two surgeries because that was the time where it was most critical that if he did catch a cold or anything that it would be more of an issue. But he didn't actually have his Glen, which is the second 
palliative surgery that these children go through. He had a Kawashima, which same idea, but this different anatomy because of the way he was set up. But once he went through that surgery, and even before that, we tried to be realistic about the germs, but before his second surgery, he was actually flying. And even now, he's been to so many different places. He's flown all over the East Coast. We're flying to Europe in a few months with him. So we were not discouraged with the germs. I did get freaked out at certain times when certain illnesses did come into the classroom that I hadn't heard of. But I remember sitting with his cardiologist discussing whether to put him in preschool. And I was going to wait six months and start him six months later. And she looked at me and she's like, well, why are you waiting until then? I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe because he'll be six months older. And she looked at me and said... (laughs) The heart he has now is the heart he's going to have for the rest of his life. Nothing is going to change between now and six months from now. So if this is something that you want to do for him and you feel that this is the right course of action and you want him in a preschool setting, then don't use his heart as an excuse not to do it. And it was very empowering advice for me. And I spoke to a cardiologist who happens to be a friend of of ours as well, and he told me the same thing. He's like, Dawn... Hayden has a heart issue. He doesn't have an immune problem. So his immune system works fine. So I sent him, and we've been lucky. And again, knock on wood, other than one sinus infection and the very beginning battling of pneumonia, which we're not even assured that's what it was, but we treated it as such. Those are the only times mm-hmm. since Caden's been born that he's had any illnesses. So he hasn't even had an ear infection, a major cold. In his class this year, there were, I think, eight different cases of headlights. There was fifth disease. There was foot, mouth, and hand disease. Everything that you can think of, and Caden was mm-hmm. fine. So I think he's Isn't got angels looking out for him. <laughs> but, um, mm-hmm. yep. but it's hard for me. I hear those issues and those concerns so often by mm-hmm. so many of these mm-hmm. moms about the germs and afraid to take their kids' places and afraid of them getting mm-hmm. sick. But it's been a non-issue for us, and maybe if he had been sicker, I would have a different opinion about that. But for Mm -hmm. him, it's not held him back, and we've let him go. And if he gets a cold, I guess we'll have to deal with it (laughs) and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that a lot of it is just that's our attitude because he had older siblings at home as well. You can only control what comes into your house to a certain extent, and I could have kept him in a bubble but that wouldn't have taken away the fact that his brother and sister were coming home from school every day with their set of school germs. So we had to be realistic for our family and realize this is the reality of what's going on. So there are going to be germs in the house. And again, we're going to have to work and let's hope it's not going to be a problem. And it, luckily it wasn't. But again, like you said, it's important to make that distinction that he was purely cardiac and there wasn't other issues involved. So it's not the case for every kid who has these defects. Yes. Well, believe it or not, it is time for us to take another commercial break, and then we'll be back in the studio. Thank you so much, Dawn, for coming on. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Texas Heart Institute were offering us a mechanical heart, and he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Give it to someone who's worthy. My father promised me a golden dress to twirl it. He held my hand and asked me where I wanted to go. Whatever strife or conflict that we experienced in our long career together was always healed by humor. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with heart moms, Amy Bennett, Adina Marie Pellucci Alcina, and Dawn Silverman. I'd also like to thank Dr. Doreen Rosenstrock for her advice and consultation on this issue that I used in the introduction to the show. Well, ladies, we are all in the studio together, and we only have a minute or two. Amy, now that you've heard me talk to Adina and Dawn, do you have a question for these ladies, or is there any parting comments that you would like to leave us with? 
this has been so fascinating to listen to everybody speak. I'm so grateful for the opportunity for us to network like this and find better options for our children. Well, I appreciate you. Amy, Adina, did you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make? It's really nice to be able to hear everybody's story. It's kind of given me a lot of information for the future since we've only had to deal with babysitters on what route we plan on going with daycare and schooling. And her information has been very helpful to me today on the show. I love that. All right, Dawn, you're the last one. You get to have the last (laughs) say. I think that this has been a wonderful opportunity. I think it's so important to hear the different stories and different people's point of view to realize that there's so many different opportunities at their disposal, just depending on where they are in their journey and their health. I love that. There is so much hope for our children who are born with heart defects today. Ladies, you have been awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And unfortunately, that concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time. Until then, please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com. And remember, my friends, there is hope. <laughs>